Welcome to the inaugural episode of the DLA Piper Ireland Real Estate Webcast Series. In each episode, we'll ask a panel of experts a number of questions about a hot topic in the Irish real estate market. This week, we kick off with social housing following on from the publication of the government's Housing for All plan last year. We're delighted to be joined today by Dara Deering, CEO at Home Building Finance Ireland, Horig Rush, CEO at Initiative Ireland, and Marie Hunt, Head of Research and Consultancy at CBRE. So to jump right in, Dara, Housing for All envisages pretty ambitious targets in terms of the delivery of homes across Ireland by 2030. Um, what, what aspects of Housing for All do you think are most important for the government to focus on to make sure these ambitious targets are met? Thanks, Kate. I think if you look at it first, let's put the targets in context. In order to deliver what's set out in Housing for All, we actually need to collectively deliver 10,000 social housing units per annum, 4,000 affordable purchase and a further 2,000 in cost rental. So it's quite a step up from where we are right now. And I think to get there, the reality is we need a range of delivery models. So of course we need local authorities to increase their output, but we also need to see collaboration between the public and private sector. We've seen examples of that up to now, which work well and we need to build on. So we've seen approved housing bodies, purchase turnkey operations directly from private developers who've sought funding from the private market. That's helped to increase housing supply. More recently, we've seen local authorities provide land that is in their ownership under license to the private sector to build homes. And at the end of that process, the homes in are handed back to the local authorities and increase supply. And thirdly, we'll have seen uh, very recently, earlier this year, the LDA come out with Project Tussock, where they're looking to, for builders and developers who have planning permission in place are ready to build, to build those units for the affordable market. So it's really about people working together and looking at different delivery models. The second area I think that stakeholders need to focus on is we need more construction workers. If we look at the numbers in Housing for All, we need to see a 70% increase in the number of people working in the sector. And how are we going to get there? Well, one thing is that we need to look at people who were previously in the sector, whether they've left within Ireland or left abroad, and how do we get them back in? And, and create an environment where they want to build homes in Ireland on a sustainable basis. And secondly, we need to recruit more people into the industry. I think the third uh, step that we need to take is to recognise that the mix of homes we supply has got to change for social housing. Um, so if you look at it on an overall basis, less than 20% of our housing stock is apartments. Um, to deliver the numbers in housing for all for social housing, we will need to deliver more apartments as well as the traditional homes. And that brings with it, Kate, a challenge around viability. The sector itself will need to look at how it innovates to bring forward quality, high quality product, but at a lower cost of construction. And the government have announced various initiatives to support infrastructure or reforms of planning. We need to see them executed so that some of the barriers to construction are removed um, over the course of this period. And I suppose finally for me, we need um, increase in the availability of debt finance. So if we look at housing for all at an overall level, we need 12 billion in funding available per year. Um, some of that will come from the government, but a lot of it has to, the increase we need has to come from the private sector. So that means we need banks lending, the traditional banks, we need the non-bank lenders um, providing funding for this sector, and we need also international funding. I think finally, the early signs are encouraging. We're seeing strong levels of construction starts. I think that's a good um, segue into 2022. We've lots of lenders providing funding uh, specifically for social housing. So I genuinely believe if all parties work together across public and private sector, we will translate some of those initiatives into increase in supply. Thanks, Dara. That's very interesting, particularly what you say about the need for innovation and for collaboration between the public and private sectors. Um, Porig, uh, Dara has given a really good overview of where she believes the government's focus needs to be in housing for all. But do you identify any other roadblocks or issues that aren't specifically called out in housing for all, but that the government needs to address? Yeah, so I think as Dara rightly mentioned, um, access to land is key here. Um, and so 
you know, as a sustainable non-bank funder, uh, at Initiative Ireland, we're very focused on small, medium and large scale developments because that's the market balance that we need. In 2017, the fast track SHD planning process was brought in to support applications over 100 units. We did see an increase in applications, but the delivery has materially lagged behind due to judicial reviews, land banking and other factors. So with Housing for All, LSDR is being set up to replace the SHD process um, with a set timeline of 32 weeks for applications over 100 units. But in the five years since 2017, we haven't seen any meaningful national attempt to streamline smaller scale multi-unit developments. And so if we want a balance in the market, that's a noticeable gap in housing for all. Um, and again, I think if we, we want to see fewer land banks and oligopolies, we need to standardize and streamline that process nationally while re retaining the decisioning at a local level. Um, but a planning application in Cork should not be materially different in terms of timelines and engagement and process and systems to one in Galway. Um, and then secondly, I guess, uh, Housing for All also touches on local authority authorities participating in value uplift from planning applications that are approved. Um, and I think uh, it's important to remember that the equity uplift in planning applications is often a material part of the equity that a developer brings when they're looking for finance. Um, and the justification for the local authorities participating is almost an argument that uh, that, that uplift is profit. Um, and the, the examples cited are somebody getting planning up an application approved and then selling it for a profit with planning, with no intention to develop. So if we don't want to penalize applicants who actually apply to build versus apply to sell post planning, then I think that distinction needs to be considered. So it's more a word of caution where something is a little bit vague sounds like a welcome initiative, but needs to be carefully implemented. And then lastly, I think um, clearer timelines are really needed. Uh, I think it's very common when you talk about five-year, 10-year programs uh, in pros to make it seem as if these things are around the corner um, when maybe they're not. And I, I think that can be very dangerous when you're in an environment where we have a, over 50% shortfall in housing supply relative to demand because we cannot afford for developers to be holding their breath, thinking that some change is about to come or about to be implemented um, when it's years away uh, and they really need to move on uh, and keep going. Thanks, Porik. So some more work to be done to streamline timelines and planning processes to ensure that there's a level playing field for developers of all sizes. Um, Marie, so something that Dara touched on a little earlier was the need for collaboration between the public and private sector in this area. What role do you see institutional and international capital having in bridging the funding gap? I think that international capital has a big role to play here. Um, we've seen international capital in the market over the last decade, primarily investing in built to rent or PRS stock, but that capital is agnostic and will go into any form of residential where it sees a return. So I think we should be capitalising on that and using the public and private sector investment um, for, for good. Um, I think it's great that we have a housing for all plan. We've had lots of plans over the years, but this one really feels that it's got teeth. And I like the fact that there's oversight of it as well. So there's a quarterly update in terms of progress, which is, is great to see. But that's not to say it's, it's hugely ambitious. So it has very, very um, high numbers in terms of public and private sector housing delivery that's required and I don't know that the local authorities have the capacity certainly at this stage to develop the extent of social housing that is required so without public and private sector coming together to enable that to happen it's going to be really really difficult to achieve those targets particularly this week when we hear about a, a very significant retrofit program we hear about all of the investment that needs to go into pyrite remediation we need a huge amount of construction workers to enable this to happen um, I mentioned already that some of the international capital that's been here for the last couple of years has been heavily invested into build to rent. It's also been hugely interested in the social housing piece, um, particularly the, it, in the leasing space where long term leases were available and it was the longevity of that income that was particularly attractive to these investors. Now, there are parts of that mechanism that government don't like, particularly the, the fact that the asset didn't revert back to the state at the end. But with a little bit of financial engineering, surely we could come to a solution that would enable this capital to continue to invest into this sector and help with the delivery of stock and come up with a mechanism where the, the end asset ends back in, in the state's balance sheet. 
Um, so I think with a bit of tweaking, we could do that rather than completely get rid of the, the previous system. And I wonder as well if there's some way to engineer that international capital to invest in the affordable housing piece. Um, is it investable in, in that sense? I suspect it is, but we would need to come up with the mechanisms to enable that to happen. Um, so I think in, in essence, in, in summary, absolutely, we need both public and private sector capital working together. And we need to welcome the international capital as opposed to condemn it. Um, some of the, the commentary in the media is very, very unhelpful because without this international capital, we're not going to be able to deliver the, the very ambitious Housing for All programme that, that we envisage. Thanks, Marie. It's, it's very clear that there's an important role for international capital to play here in bridging the funding gap, but that certain innovations are needed in order to make the area more attractive to investors. Thank you to Porig, to Dara and to Marie for your valuable insights today. If you'd like to know more about social housing or about any other aspect of real estate or development finance, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or another member of the DLA Piper team. Until our next episode, goodbye and thank you for tuning in.